study and prayer meeting. Once again, uh, this is our primary means of ministering to people through the live stream. We're thankful we can do that. I want to give you a, a, the order of service before we get going here because uh, we're changing things up just a little bit uh, with this uh, ministry format. Uh, just a little bit, uh, I'm going to open us in prayer. Brother Brian will lead us in a couple songs. After he's uh, finished singing, I will preach. I'll give the message to them. And I'll tell you what, if you have your Bibles with you at this time, if you want to open them to 2 Kings chapter 13, 2 Kings chapter 13, that's where we will begin. That might save you a little time when we get started. Uh, so after the preaching, uh, we will jump right into the the offering, actually. We're going to do that after the preaching. And so I suppose there you can grade the preaching by the offertory, I guess. Uh, after the offering, we will have another song. And uh, then we will close in prayer. We're going to take some time in our closing prayer, though, to share different requests that people have called in. And so I hope you'll stay with us through all of the service here uh, as we look to pray for our elected officials, pray for certain members and uh, uh, certain uh, needs that people have called in. They appreciate you staying with us as well and praying, joining us in prayer. So uh, one of the things I've done this week more than I have in a long time is I've, I've been a little more active with the social media. And I am uh, I'm very uh, limited in my social media skills. I actually feel like the old hillbilly who had moved to the city and his poor wife had a heart attack, and uh, boy, he called 911, and uh, the operator answers, and he gives uh, the operator his name, and the operator says, where do you live? He says, 325 Eucalyptus Street, and the operator says, can you spell that? He said, uh, uh, how about I drive around down to Oak Street, O-A-K. That's about how I feel with, with the social media, okay? I'm going to keep it as simple as possible. So let me go ahead and have a word of prayer with you here. And I'll have Brother Brian come up and lead us in a song. Father, we love you. We're thankful, Lord, to be able to have service. And Lord, we pray that uh, this would be a special time for each person that is uh, uh, participating that is paying attention. We pray that they be encouraged and refreshed through your word. And we pray, Lord, that uh, your people would be strengthened in the faith. We pray that through this you would be glorified. And we certainly pray, Lord, for those who may be wondering about their salvation. We pray that, uh, Lord, they, they get that assurance that only you can give them. Help us, Lord, to be a good witness where we're at to family, friends, and the people that we come in contact with. Uh, we love you. We thank you for your mercy and goodness. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's have some. Amen. Let's all sing a new name in glory. In 31, a new name in glory. Oh 
2 Kings 13, chapter 13. If you'd like to make a note in your Bible, turn over to Hebrews 9, Hebrews chapter 9. You may turn there at the end of the service. Hebrews chapter 9, if you want to mark that in your Bible. Uh, I've probably done more texting this week than I have in a long time, maybe ever in one week, uh, just because it's the means of socializing. And I've had preachers text me, and they text me some serious messages, some humorous messages, and some of them were very innovative. Uh, I had one preacher text me uh, a good way to baptize converts during this time when we have to exercise social distancing. And uh, he had a caption of a dunk tank. And uh, that'd be ideal, you know. We could set up the dunk tank outside and just say we have a special baptismal service. And, and I can just, I can see this working, you know. All right, so-and-so is, is stepped into, has stepped into the baptismal or the dunk tank. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll start calling the baptismal tank the dunk tank. The dunk tank. And we'll have some people with some softballs back here. And I'll say, okay, so and so, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I got to make sure they hit the mark to be able to say, buried in the likeness of his death. And sure enough, I might throw it three or four times and say, just hold on with me here. We're going to bury him sooner or later. Anyway, so I like that. That could be a lot of fun. We probably get people looking to get baptized who really didn't need to get baptized, though. So. All right, 2 Kings chapter 13. What I decided to do, uh, I told my wife that I want to take uh, a little time each week and just in my casual Bible reading, I, I really want God to speak to me through my, my regular Bible reading. And to be honest, I, I'm sure none of you have ever done this, but uh, I had got to where I was reading my Bible, checking it off, and I was done with it, and I wasn't really getting a whole lot, about, whole lot out of my Bible reading. And so I thought, you know, I need to incorporate this as though I'm looking for sermons as well. I'm looking for soul food. Because for me as a preacher, I would read it, and then I'd put it aside, and I'd go to whatever I was studying for the sermon, and then I'd work on that, and I really wouldn't get anything out of my Bible reading. So I thought, all right, let's, uh, let's just uh, ask the Lord to speak to me. And, and so this past week, there there have been a couple passages of scriptures that have stood out to me, and this is one of them that we're going to look at. And I just began to write down some uh, ideas, some applications that I felt helped me. And uh, this one in particular, uh, it moved me. It moved me. And uh, I hope it will help you. I, I really do. But uh, it had the kind of impact on my heart that it challenged me and it stirred me to action. And I like... I like it when the Lord does that, okay? So, if you're at home and you have your Bible in your hand and you're able to stand, if you want to stand with us for the reading of God's Word, that'd be a wonderful thing. We're going to begin reading here in verse 14. Verse 14. And uh, I think I'm going to try to stay behind this pulpit, but let me get this on just in case, okay? Turn this on here. In 2 Kings 13, before I read, let me say real quickly what's going on. Uh, this is in reference to Elisha the prophet, and he is about ready to pass. He is sick, and this sickness will lead to his death. He has been a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel. Israel, as a nation, has been divided into two kingdoms. The southern kingdom uh, being called Judah. And the northern kingdom actually uh, kept the name Israel. They were all Israelites, but that's the way the Lord divided them. And the northern kingdom, for the, most of its history, had been an idolatrous kingdom. They had turned from the Lord. There hadn't been any good kings. Now, there have been a couple kings who sought the Lord, but not enough to qualify them as great kings, okay? Uh, you may know some people like that in your life, but... We're in a situation with a prophet. He has been the only shining light in that northern kingdom. And God has shown grace to the people of the northern kingdom, really because of this prophet. He's about ready to die. A new king has just taken the throne. His name is Joash. Now, his grandfather had sought the Lord. But, again, 
still not enough to give him a, the reputation of a good king. But God showed him grace. And now he is at the throne of this Joash, this young man. And he takes the throne and he knows the prophet of Israel is about ready to die. He goes to see him. Wise move, Joash. And his heart's broken. Because he knows why God's blessed Israel and why God's protected Israel. And so we're going to take up a reading with that in mind. Verse 14. Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thy hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance. And the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till thou have consumed them. I want to talk to you tonight about the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. That will be our title. Father, I am thankful for your holy word, and I'm thankful for these powerful historical stories that are written to teach us not just history, but doctrine, personal application, how to live the Christian life. And I'm thankful that many of these Old Testament stories illustrate New Testament truth. We're thankful for the work of the Lord Jesus Christ who shines the light on our hearts and allows us to get a better understanding of the Old Testament. Speak to hearts now. Help me to speak. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. Well, we considered the condition of the kingdom, we considered the condition of the king, we considered the condition of the prophet. Once again, though, just a reminder that the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, is in dire straits. If the prophet dies, who is going to hold them up before God? In the mind of the king, it was the prophet that was holding things together, but the prophet was always trying to point people to God the God of Israel. And we're going to see that inevitably it's not the man of God, it's the God of the man that makes the difference. And yet one last time, this dear prophet, in his, near his deathbed, he has one last word of hope. He tells the king, he says, I want you to shoot that arrow through the window toward the east. And as he shoots it, he pronounces he pronounces deliverance. It's a promise from the Almighty God through the prophet to the king. This is the Lord's deliverance. One arrow would be shot. This is the Lord's deliverance. He made a promise. I want to pause on that part of the passage here, and this will certainly be more devotional. I want to pause, and here's what came to my mind as I browse this. You see, as I look at the whole Bible and I consider the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the plan of salvation and the mind of God and the condition of humanity before Christ came to this earth, we were in dire straits as human beings, condemned. We, we were under the curse of sin. And God would shoot an arrow to this earth and it would land in an obscure place. We don't know where this arrow will land. We just know it was shot out that window. And God would shoot this arrow out of the window of heaven, and it would land in an obscure place. And I realize Bethlehem does not seem obscure to us, but it was at the time Jesus came, when he was born in a man. That arrow landed there, and that arrow grew to be a man. And let's, let's watch this arrow for a little while. Let's just visualize this arrow while it moved on earth. Let's watch this arrow as it goes to the Sea of Galilee and sees these fishermen cleaning their nets and says, 
why don't you uh, thrust out your bolts a little bit so I can speak. And so they do. And he, then he says, why don't you uh, take them out into the deep now. Launch out into the deep. And let down your nets for a draft. And so they did. And lo and behold, what was a bad day of fishing became an overwhelming miracle in the minds of these fishermen. They caught so many fish they couldn't even hardly bring them, bring them into the, the boat. The Bible says the net broke. As a matter of fact, they didn't completely obey the Lord. We watch this arrow as it moves into the synagogue on a particular Sabbath day. There's a man in the synagogue who is demon-possessed. Nobody knew it until the arrow showed up, the light of the world. And all of a sudden it was revealed that this man was demon-possessed, and we find that the Lord cast out that demon. And we find that, once again, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance doing a work in a heart that touched it. The arrow moves on. We see that arrow sit, coming across the path of two blind men crying out for help. Lord, have mercy on us. And they embraced the Lord's deliverance and they got their sight. We see that arrow going across the path of, flying across the path of ten leprous men. And they too cried out for mercy and they embraced the power of the Lord's deliverance and they were healed of their leprosy. We see that arrow once again in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And there's a woman that stooped over. She cannot stand up straight. As a matter of fact, Jesus would say about her, she had been bound by Satan under that present day. But the arrow of the Lord's deliverance showed up and she stood straight after meeting that arrow. We can move on and on and on, but we move to the tomb of Lazarus in John chapter 11. Mary and Martha are brokenhearted. They've cried, cried to the Lord for help. And uh, in their minds, the Lord has shown up late. Their brother's dead. He'd have got to, Jesus would have got there earlier. He wouldn't have died. Oh, but they misunderstood the power of the arrow of deliverance. He would say to people standing by, roll away the stone. And when they rolled away the stone, he would say, Lazarus, come forth. That arrow of the Lord's deliverance touched Lazarus and he came forth out of that tomb, walking out of that tomb with grave clothes. A dead man, now alive, because of an encounter with the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. I think that is awesome, but I tell you, it's something even more powerful than that. The day came when that arrow of the Lord's deliverance would go to an old rugged cross on Calvary just outside of Jerusalem and in the uh, mind of those standing by die and he really did die and they buried him three days and they thought this was it but the arrow of the Lord's deliverance conquered death and the grave we're going to celebrate Easter in a couple weeks it's not Easter's not all about chocolate and bunnies and all of that I don't mind that stuff, but Easter, if we want to celebrate it in the biblical sense, and we need to rep it represents the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every Sunday we gather together, it, it, it's, it's symbolic of remembering Resurrection Day. It was the day the Lord Jesus rose from the dead, the first day of the week. That arrow of the Lord's deliverance conquered death in the grave, and all who put their faith in Him received victory over hell. And can have victory over sin. I don't know if you remember the day that you received Christ as your Savior. But I remember the day that I called upon the Lord Jesus as my Savior. I remember the day the arrow of the Lord's deliverance began to work on my heart. Kind of like the Apostle Paul. How he kicked against the bricks because the arrow of the Lord's deliverance was working and working and working. But would not have full effect till it entered the heart of the Apostle Paul. I remember in Fife Lake, Michigan, Polly, if you're watching, I'll forever be thankful that you and Wayne and Mike and Tracy and Aaron were church-going people who loved the Lord. And I was in a house where God could do a work on my heart. And I know there were other people that God had brought into my life before that that got me thinking, but it was there in your house, in the upper room, right next to Mike, where I called upon Jesus to be my personal Savior. 
And all I tell you, I know I didn't change immediately, but something changed inside me immediately. The arrow of the Lord's deliverance got a hold of my heart. There was new life, and there was new light. I truly began to see some things different. Regardless of my limited Bible knowledge, when I received Christ as my Savior, immediately my mind lit up and thought, that is the most important decision I'll ever make in my whole life. I didn't need any teacher to tell me that. I knew that if I'm not going to hell because of what I just did, it doesn't get any more important than that. I'm so thankful. I'm thankful that God continued to work during this time. He's continued to work in my life. He's continued to work in the life of every person who's ever received Jesus as Savior. Now, they may not always look like they've been delivered, but if they've truly been saved, God knows it. They know it. And in, 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 inevitably, it will be proven. I know that's really devotional, but I want to move on in our text to pull out something else because I feel like there's a great salvation, sanctification lesson in this passage of Scripture. We look back at chapter 13 of 2 Kings, and, and we just read in verse 17 about the arrow being shot out the window. One singular arrow that gave the promise of the Lord's deliverance. But that wasn't the end of the story there as far as the prophet and the king went. You see, there was a personal problem. The king had a problem. There was an enemy that had been overtaking his kingdom, had begun to gain dominion over his kingdom. And this era of the Lord's deliverance was not just a deliverance uh, of uh, evil, but it was to be a deliverance of this particular nation. It was to deliver Israel from Syria. And so, verse 18, the prophet says this to the king. It says, he said, take the arrows, and he took them, and he said unto the king of Israel, smite upon the ground, and he smote thrice and stayed. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times, then hast thou smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. And so as we look at this idea of deliverance here, and as we, we use it to kind of illustrate what God's done in our life for salvation, Christ only had to die once to deliver my soul from hell. You only had to die once to deliver your soul from hell. You and I as believers in Christ are living from victory. We are living our life from the springboard of victory. But there is a personal part that we play in regards to everyday spiritual victories. God is not going to just treat us like little infants who live completely depend upon their parents their whole life. Oh, no. Now, God has given us something to do. The king had a responsibility. His role in the deliverance, so to speak, was to smite the ground. Now, that's interesting. It wasn't to smite the enemy, not at that time. The role, his role, was to smite the ground. What do you mean, what ground? The ground in the presence of the prophet. In the chamber room, in a quiet room, in, in a private room that the public eye couldn't see. It was there that the king was to smite the ground with these arrows. And the Bible says he smote the ground three times. He took three arrows and he shot them into the ground and he stayed. And the prophet got angry. Huh. Was he angry because there would no longer be the promise of deliverance? No, that wasn't the issue. He was angry because it was obvious that the degree of passion revealed to the Lord in private would reveal the degree of victory in public. There were some things that need to be pointed out here in regards to the king's role. It was personal. You see, he's a saved man. Uh, I could put it like this. You who are saved, you're saved because you personally made that decision. And if you grow in the Lord, if you, if you begin to experience spiritual growth and spiritual victories over sin, 
It's going to be because you made personal decisions, not somebody else making them for you. You have to make that decision. It was personal. It was optional, too. He didn't tell the king how many arrows to shoot into the ground, did he? He didn't. The king obviously had a quiver full of them. He had more than three, did he not? But he shot three, telling us that he at most used half of the quiver. There may have been more. You know, there's something said about the Macedonians and their giving. Paul would say this, that they gave beyond their power. Nobody can give beyond their power until they've given their power. You don't experience the extra until you've given what you've got. And I'm not talking financial. I'm talking about devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. It was personal. It was optional. This decision, this call from the man of God to the king. Smite to the ground. I'm not talking to your neighbor. I'm not talking to the, uh, uh, your servants. I'm talking to you, king. Smite the ground. It's optional. You choose how many arrows you're going to shoot to the ground. And it was detrimental. It was detrimental. What do you mean? Well, we read it. According to his smiting the ground, he would, it would determine the number of victories he would actually experience. As I read through this, I couldn't help but to think that I'm grateful that the arrow of the Lord's deliverance has saved me regardless of my lack of passion at times. I'm grateful that I'm secure in the Lord Jesus Christ regardless of my lack of devotion at times. And I've lived just long enough to discover that uh, the great truth of your private devotional life and how it affects your personal public walk and your ability to conquer temptation. And your ability to be delivered from sins that so easily beset you in the past. And your, your ability to overcome the things that are self-destructive in your life. Sin. Whether it's drinking or smoking or pornography or a foul mouth. Whether it's envy or covetousness or pride or a temper problem. I'm telling you the victory deliverance comes from that nonsense according to your personal devotion. You know, I know people who at one time had a great devotional life because I could see it. I could see it in the way they sang. I could see it in the way they witnessed. I could see it in their everyday behavior. But something happened. They stayed. They stayed. Huh? Well, it says here the king smoked thrice and stayed. That's enough. I do I fear too often in our modern day Christianity, we have just enough Christianity in our lives to make us feel good about ourselves, but not give us victory over personal sin, not help us to live holy, and not certainly not make an impact on the lost souls around us. And by the way, it's easy to do just enough to make yourself feel good, and yet let the world around you die and go to hell. You want to make an impact, you want to make a difference, friend, you've got to keep the passion burning in your private devotions. Your walk with God. Every day you get up and read your Bible and you're shooting an arrow to the ground. Throughout the day as you're thinking about the Word of God and the promises of God, you're shooting an arrow to the ground. As you talk about the Scriptures, you're shooting an arrow into the ground. As you're paying attention to the presence of God and through your everyday walk, you're shooting an arrow to the ground. That's why the Bible says pray without ceasing. That's why the Bible says continue in prayer. That's why the Bible says men ought always to pray, not to faint. Friend, what, what am I telling you? Keep shooting those arrows. Keep shooting those arrows between you and God. And I'm telling you, that's where the victory comes. That's where the victory comes. That's why this passage of Scripture spoke to me this week. Because I needed it. Right now, one of my concerns, it's not a fear, it's a concern. One of my concerns with us not being able to have church fellowship 
is how easy it is to backslide. How easy it is to get worldly. How easy it is for this just to become a spectator sport at most. I'm here to tell you, if you have any concern for the lost souls in your family, whether they be children, whether they be brothers or sisters, whether they be parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles, or friends or people you work with, don't think you're going to make a difference in their lives if you're not smiting those arrows in private to the Lord and showing your passion. This king, what was it about him? There was a lack of passion. Jesus would talk to a church about their lack of passion. In Revelation chapter 3, they would be the seventh of seven churches the Lord would speak to. We know them as the Laodicean church. And Jesus would say about them, you think you're clothed and yet spiritually you're naked. You think you're full, yet spiritually you're hungry. You think you can see, yet spiritually you're blind. You think you're wealthy, but spiritually you're bankrupt. You see, the problem with the church, that church was they had everything materially they wanted. They could hunker down and relax. Everything was all right out because their dependence was on all the material things of this world. Boy, the wake-up day would come. Because the, the great reality was Jesus wasn't even in that church. See, they knew how to go through the motions, and I'm sure they, they may have even sang the praise of the Lord. And once church was out, Jesus was off their mind. Jesus said that, uh, you think you have need of nothing. He said, but I want you to know I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. You'll open up. I'll come in and sup with you and be with me. And you'll find out what you've been missing all along. Some of you, you're stuck in the house. And yet, the danger is if you've got everything this world could ask for, you can relax and not really see the need to stay close to God. That was my concern as I read this. You see, if you, want to make an, if you want your life to be useful for God, if you want your life to, make, to be significant, to have an eternal impact while you're here, there's only one way for that to happen. Let God use you. Let God use you. What are you passionate about? I'm great, in a way, I'm grateful that football is over. I'm grateful that there's no basketball to watch. I'm grateful there's no baseball to watch. I'm grateful the sports of I had to go back to the History Channel. I'm grateful for all of that. The Bible talks about the people having a problem with Baal worship. I call it ball worship. I like sports, but I also know that it can become an idol that draws people away from the Lord. So, may the Lord use this to help you examine your own heart at this time, all right? Let me have a word of prayer with you. Father, I love you and I'm thankful for your truth, for your scriptures. Help us, Lord, to be sensitive to your leadership. Help us, Lord God, to be mindful that we need to stay with you in the privacy of our house, our room, and get alone with your word and allow your word to speak to us. And allow your word to be real to us. And allow ourselves to unplug all the distractions of this world so that we can hear your voice. Father, help people. And if there are any that are watching that have not received the Lord Jesus as their Savior, I pray that they would do as I did a number of years ago and just call on you from the sincerity of their heart to save their soul from hell. And from that point, may they look to your word May they get plugged into a good church. May they follow you in believers' baptism. And may they continue to grow in service for you. And continue to point people to you until you return. 
Bless us now. We ask this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. We're going to have another song at this time before our offering. Let Brother Brian come back up here. Amen. We'll sing Saved by the Blood.